introduction, and thank all of you for coming tonight. Uriner fish is the story of the, of the human body told through the fossils, the embryos, and the DNA of everything from reptiles to, to a fish, to worms, to jellyfish, to sponges and microbes. The reason why we can do that is there are deep connections among all life on this planet. And those connections are written in every organ, every cell, uh, and, and every gene in our bodies. And in fact, those, those connections reflect 3.5 billion years of history of our species, or our, of our lineage, uh, and our planet. Now, I called the book Your Inner Fish, instead of Your Inner Sponge, a Worm, or <laughs> anything else for that matter, for a simple reason. And that is, to me, fish are a very powerful system to understand our own skeletons and understand our own anatomy. In fact, they are, um, do they like to get like, um, in fact, for me, they've been very important because that's one of the main foci folks of my research is really understanding how fish, like this one up here, which existed about 380 million years ago, evolved to walk on land, to giving rise to a creature like this down here for about, three, about 365 million years ago. But this is a huge transition in the evolution of life, a jump from life in water that is breathing, moving around, excreting, reproducing, and all that stuff in water to a creature that does most of that stuff on land. That is a major evolutionary jump. And when I was a graduate student, this really caught my eye. I mean, this really, this is in the mid-80s, I decided that this was going to be the central focus of my research. And indeed, it has been so uh, for the last 25 years. Scary thought. <laughs> but it has been. <laughs> and so, I, you know, in my laboratory, we look at this by looking at development as well as fossils. Um, Anyway, so, um, uh, so, so essentially I've been looking at this um, for a variety of levels. And so what we started out to do is try to find new fossils that tell us about how this happened, to discover new stuff. And to do that, we really applied three simple rules to decide on new sites to look for fossils. And they really aren't that simple. The first is to find places in the world that have rocks of the right age to tell us about this transition. Remember I told you we're dealing with about 380 million years ago here. We're dealing with about 365 or so uh, here. Obviously, we want uh, rocks that, that, that contain some, uh, some sediments in the middle. The other thing is, is we need places in the world where rocks of the right type are exposed. Not every kind of rock preserves fossils. Indeed, these kinds of creatures don't live in every environment that would naturally form rocks. So what we've spent time doing over the years is really developing a search image for the right kinds of places to look, or the right kinds of rocks to find fossils in. Finally, it does us no good if our beautiful uh, rocks of the right age and the right type are buried underneath the ground. Really, what we need are places in the world where those rocks are exposed to the surface. Okay, is it any secret that paleontologists love deserts? The reason why is they have access to the rocks and the fossils that would typically weather out of those rocks. There's a third um, reason, uh, this is not a scientific one, and sometimes it's money. So, um, this is the state of Pennsylvania. My first academic job was at the University of Pennsylvania, right down here. And as a young assistant professor starting out in 1989, I had the need to develop a new research program, but also I didn't have a whole ton of money to do it. And so what I wanted was a safe research project, a project that I can do basically on the cheap, uh, that I could do it fairly regularly during the course of the year. And to do that, we applied our three criteria, and it turns out Pennsylvania is wonderful for this. Here's a map of Pennsylvania a geological map streamlined to show where rocks of Devonian age, roughly of the right age we're talking about for the transition from, from fish to amphibian, where they're preserved in purple here. So large swath of Devonian across the state of Pennsylvania. What was also beautiful was if you look at this little cartoon, and this is a cartoon of what Pennsylvania looked like back about 365 million years ago. Get Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Harrisburg out of your brain and think Amazon Delta, okay? So you have the highlands to the eastern part of the state. You had an inland sea to the western part of the state, much where Pittsburgh is today, and a series of rivers and streams draining from east to west. Now, if you are interested in understanding the transition from fish to amphibian, this is perfect because you can sample in the ancient Devonian world parts of the ancient sea, parts of the ancient the estuaries and deltas, all the way upstream. You get a real nice cross section of the environments that likely capture this. So in Pennsylvania, we had rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type. It was real cheap. I could get my station wagon and drive to these things for the weekend. The problem is Pennsylvania is not a desert. It's not renowned for its exposure of rocks. Indeed, what we ended up doing was following the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation around 
as they, um, as they develop new roads. So what Ted Deschler, who was the graduate student who, who did a lot of this with me and is still continuing it, and I would do, is we would call PennDOT. And we'd say, well, you know, where are you digging roads? And we'd follow them around. I mean, we had assigned every insurance waiver known to man to do that. Um, but we would follow their trucks as they widened roads, as they made bends in roads and so forth. And this is one of the most beautiful sites that we worked on up there. And it's phenomenal. It's Devonian age rocks. It's these red beds here. Here you see the strata or layers, one on top of one another. There's a human being for scale. Um, and what's remarkable here is that these are ancient streams. What you're seeing in these layers is the life history of a stream, the birth, life, and death of an ancient stream as it, as it, as it meanders its course. What was also wonderful was that these ancient stream beds contained fossils. We started to originally find stuff like this, large teeth the size of railroad spikes. Then over time what we started to find were whole jaws of these things, which Ted here is holding uh, the front end of one of these jaws. These jaws were as long as your arm, with teeth the size of my thumb. I mean, giant fish, about 16 feet long or so, large predatory fish. Then we started to find the skeletons of smaller fish that had, that had armor on them. And we started to find all, a, whole, a whole ecosystem, if you will. Uh, we started to find plants and invertebrates, just wonderful. And you know, we're doing this as trucks are whizzing by <laughs> you know, every day. You know, here's a disconnect between present and past, which is wonderful, right? Here I'm standing by the side of a road, and now I'm at the State College, Pennsylvania, and I'm looking at an ancient Devonian ecosystem, an, an ancient uh, delta. Uh, 365 million years old. Then we started to find something really interesting. We started to find individual limb bones, which this is an upper arm bone known as the humerus. We started to find individual limb bones of early land living or, or, or limbed animals. These were wonderful. We found a shoulder, which is the first thing we found. We found an upper arm bone. We subsequently found a leg bone, upper leg bone, a femur, uh, portions of the skull, uh, and so forth. <coughs> really wonderful. And from these things, we were able, and this is a reconstruction done by National Geographic, um, we were able to piece together what this roadside rocks of Pennsylvania looked like 365 or so million years ago. That large fish I was telling you about with the fish, the teeth the size of railroad spikes, that's this guy here. Uh, we also had a lot of small armored creatures. We have evidence of some of the first forests. These are first some of the, uh, the plants with tree habit, uh, small shrubby little things. And then we find bits and pieces of some of the earliest creatures to walk on land. Here's an early tetrapod, literally meaning four-legged uh, creature. Okay. But there was a problem. By about 1997, Ted and I realized we weren't getting too far with these rocks in Pennsylvania. Because the, tetrapod, the fish to tetrapod transition already happened. We were already finding, like this thing here I just showed you, this is a good tetrapod. This is not a transitional form. Okay. What we needed was a place to go back in time. Okay? We needed a place where these rocks were preserved about 10 million years older uh, to give us a sense of where this, uh, uh, of this transition. To give you a sense of the problem, let me just forgive me a bit as I go into a little anatomy. Let's just step back and look at the fish amphibian transition because it will give you a sense of the kind of puzzles Ted and I were, were seeking to solve. So as I told you here, here's a fish, a lobe fin fish, literally meaning it has a fleshy lobe with actually a bone that corresponds to our arm bone. There's a creature from about 380 million years ago, and here's one from 365-ish. As you can see, the body plan or the architecture of this creature looks very different from the creature on the bottom. Look at the head, for instance. Fish, most of them at this time period, have a conical head with eyes pretty much on either side. The earliest amphibians, the earliest land-living creatures, have a flat, almost crocodilian-like head with eyes on top, little notches on the back, and big old nostrils in the front. Okay, so it's a big change in architecture here. There are other features as well. Another big feature is fish don't have necks, at least these, these uh, the low finned fish. They have a series of bones that connect the, bo the outer bones of the skull to the shoulder. So when a fish wants to bend its head, it's bending its, its, net, its body as well. Whereas we, just like these land-living creatures, have a neck where the head of these early land-living creatures is separated from the shoulder. And you have a series of joints in the vertebrae here where the head can swivel independently of the body. Okay? That's another thing. And of course, one of the big differences between you know, fish, such as these lobe fins that swim in water, and the earliest limbed animals is the presence of limbs, which are essentially transformed fins. And they constitute uh, basically fingers and toes, wrists and ankles. So essentially, what I'm just giving you is an overview of how many anatomical differences separate these things. And the trouble with our work in Pennsylvania is we were finding these things. We weren't really uncovering the essence of how this transformation happened. 
the party was over uh, by the time these, these rocks that we were working on were laid down. And so this was sort of the nature of the, how things looked in 1997. These are the earliest tetrapods here, creatures known from Devonian rocks in Greenland, 362 to 365 million year old rocks in Greenland. And these were some of the fish we were finding, as well as colleagues uh, from around the world, uh, were finding successively closer to them. But there was still a fairly large gap between a fish that looked like this, with a quasi-flathead, but complete fins, uh, and these uh, early limbed animals. Furthermore, if you map this out on time, you know, you had te the, the earliest limbed forms up here at around 365, 363 million years ago, and then this assembled the fish quite a bit down. Basically, a big gap existed uh, where pretty much where the question mark is. So Ted and I wanted to fill that question mark. And so what we did is we applied our three criteria. Rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type and exposures. We went through every geological map we could find, every state or country geological survey record that we could dig out. We got out satellite photos and so forth. And we had the idea maybe to work in Alaska or Western United States. But then one day um, in the winter, I'll never forget this day as long as I live, in the winter of 1998, we were in my office. I was at the University of Pennsylvania at the time. It was the morning. I don't know why that's relevant, but it was the morning. <laughs> <laughs> then I got into an argument. And um, it was nothing big. We were always getting in arguments, uh, debates and stuff. And uh, to settle it, I, I, I reached for an undergraduate geology textbook that was in my office. And this is the textbook, Evolution of the Earth by Dot and Batten, second edition. And in going through that textbook, I found a figure which not only stopped the argument with Ted, uh, I didn't settle it, but it just stopped us. We, we, it was so important. Uh, but it defined the course of our research for the next 10 years up to the present day. This one undergraduate college textbook figure. Let me show you. It's worth spending a little time on it. It was important to us. So this is it. I'll I'm going to spend a little time describing it. It says, Upper Devonian sedimentary facies. Now what that means in English is rocks more or less of the right age and rocks possibly of the right type. Now what you see here is that in a little more detail is um, you see North America. Here's Mexico. Here's the United States. Here's Canada. Here's Greenland. Here's the Canadian Arctic. And superimposed on that is an interpretation of the ge Devonian age geology uh, of uh, the, the environments that the rocks were formed um, uh, in North America. So what they mapped is an ancient seaway or ocean in the western part of North America. But in this textbook, they identified three areas that contained ancient delta systems, like the Amazon. The first one was very familiar to us. This ongoing, it's what it says, ongoing Catskill project. Sort of here. But this is where we were working in eastern Pennsylvania, right? So that was mapped, and we knew it well. There's this one up here, East Greenland. It was really well studied. Remember I told you that uh, some of the earliest known limbed animals were discovered from East Greenland back in the 20s and 30s? Well, that's the site of it in this ancient delta system. This is what stopped us in our tracks, was this third one, which was a swath of, um, of, of delta exposures of Devonian age that extended 1,500 kilometers east to west in the Canadian Arctic. That's what stopped the argument we tell. We couldn't believe our eyes. So we got on the internet and said, does anybody work there? Well, yeah, plenty of people work there. The oil and gas geologists, the wonderful Canadian Geological Survey, mapped this stuff with great precision. Did a wonderful job. Ashton Embry and his team at Calgary did phenomenal work up there. But no vertebrate paleontologist had ever been up there to look for fossils. We couldn't believe our luck. And it got better. When we dug uh, Embry's, Ashton's papers, um, it turns out this is a map of the area. Um, so here's where, what we're dealing with is Nunavut territory. There's the North Pole. So here is Nunavut territory. Right, it's the outline over here, flag of Nunavut, just for fun. Um, so zoom in right here. This is Ellesmere Island, okay? And you can see Ashton, sort of the superimposed here is where Devonian age rocks, rocks more or less of the right age, are exposed. Now what you don't see is a geological column here, just to remind me that these rocks are actually older than those in Pennsylvania by about 10 million years. Okay, so the story got a whole lot better. Not only do we have great exposures of rock over 1,500 kilometers of the Canadian Arctic, but these are most definitely of the right age. Remember the question mark I showed you a couple slides ago? That's your question mark in time. It was beautiful. Um, and one more thing got better. Um, this is more or less the cartoon that they used to describe it. I, I adapted from a previous slide. It essentially, it was a delta system of the highlands more or less to the east, an inland sea to the western part of the Arctic, streams draining from east to west. Rocks of the right type, rocks most definitely of the right age, unexplored, a phenomenal opportunity. Ted and I 
really excited. So uh, we went to lunch, and um, we went to a Chinese food restaurant, which is down the street uh, from my office at Penn, and uh, I had a fortune cookie uh, at the end of lunch. And my fortune cookie said, soon you will be at the top of the world. <laughs> I kid you not. So I had that fortune cookie. I glued it to my door at Penn. In fact, it might even still be there. I, and I left it when I moved. Anyway, so now we had a new challenge. Yeah, no longer uh, were we getting in our station wagons and driving to central Pennsylvania. You know, we're working here. Okay, this is 80 north. This is land of 24-hour daylight in the, in the summer, 24-hour darkness in the winter, polar bears. Uh, you're far away from any logistical support, so there's a whole supply chain to worry about. Um, so, <coughs> and to give you a sense of the challenges, this is the nearest village. It contains about 175 people. This is a picture of that village uh, in, uh, in, in spring. So I can show uh, a sense of the nature of the challenge. And it's also it's far away from us, so really far away. So we're really dependent on aircraft. You take a jet to uh, southern uh, uh, Baffin Island, and then you take prop planes for another 1,500 miles uh, north to these sites, do you know? Um, and you get by, this is the main, I don't know, if you've been in, in the Arctic or Antarctic, or if you've been in the bush, this is a plane you've probably been on. It's called a de Havilland Twin Otter. Truly a remarkable aircraft. It has a stall speed of 55 miles an hour. I mean, it feels unnatural when it takes off in certain headwinds. Anyway, so this plane can actually land directly on the tundra. Um, and then we ferry ourselves with helicopters to the site. This creates lots of problems for us because, you know, we have to bring in all our food, so we have to watch our weights very carefully of how much stuff we bring in. And in terms of the science we do, it really affects us greatly because fossils are heavy. Okay? So we're graduate students, and we want to bring the graduate students home. So, um, you know, uh, the, so we have to leave a lot of fossils up there at the end of, uh, at the end of each season. And this is kind of what camp looks like uh, before it goes on the plane. This is usually, in the beginning, we were taking small crews. Uh, our food goes in these little plastic tubs. There are polar bears out here, so we like to reduce the, uh, the smells. We um, usually involve um, kids from the local Inuit community. The community member I showed you, 150 miles away. This is Brian at a good talk who worked with us one year. We've had We've had others join us. So we had the idea in 1998. We started uh, the first expedition with great energy and verve in 1999. This is what camp looked like in 1999.